Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jason Newton from WBAL TV 11 News, and tonight we present a one hour debate featuring the top two contenders for Maryland governor. Uh, this is a joint production of Maryland Public Television and WBAL TV 11. We also like to acknowledge those of you watching on NBC in Washington and listening on WBAL News Radio here in Baltimore. I'll be your moderator tonight and hopefully keep things on track as we explore key issues on the minds of Maryland voters. We'll get to our candidates in just a moment. First, I'd like to introduce you to our inquisitive panel of journalists, starting with reporter Pamela Wood from the Baltimore Banner. Also, Tracy Wilkins is the Prince George's County Bureau Chief for NBC Washington. News editor Alexis Taylor is representing the Afro-American newspapers. And news anchor Jeff Salkin of Maryland Public Television. Tonight's debate will also feature questions from student journalists from both Morgan State University and Salisbury University. So. Let's get right to it. Tonight, we'll hear from Dan Cox. He is the Republican nominee for governor and Wes Moore, the Democratic nominee, as selected by Maryland voters during the primary election this summer. We'd like to offer each of our candidates the opportunity to make an opening statement. And we used yesterday's Maryland Lottery Midday Pick 3 number to randomly select which candidate will go first. We could have done the old coin flip, but this is way more fun. So, Mr. Moore, the Pick 3 was in your favor. You win no money, but you win the chance to begin with you. I appreciate that, and good evening. Uh, this can be Maryland's moment. We have amazing people and incredible potential, but not everybody's in a position to succeed. And I understand that. I was raised by an immigrant single mom after my dad died. I joined the Army and learned a basic principle. Leave no one behind. And as your governor, that will be the new mission for the state of Maryland. Now, I understand you are concerned about paying groceries and bills, but we can build an economy that works for everyone. I understand that you're worried about safety in your own communities, but we can work with communities and law enforcement to ensure public safety. And I know you're concerned about your rights being stripped away. Maryland can be a state that protects abortion rights and abortion access. My name is Wes Moore. I'm a combat veteran, a small business owner, a third generation Marylander, and I'd be honored to have your support, Maryland. Mr. Cox. Well, hello, Maryland. Hello, Maryland. It's an honor to be here to represent your interests. I am a husband, my uh, precious bride of 26 years, my lovely family of 10 children. We are serving you, uh, and in the State House, I've served for many years uh, in. Uh, working as a small businessman. I've worked, uh, grew up on a farm and I had to work my way through college. I understand and I feel the pain of putting food on the table that so many Marylanders are feeling right now. And that is why in the legislature I stood with Governor Hogan to ensure that our streets were safe and that our taxes were lower. I was on the governor's accountability, um, uh, crime accountability board. I was on the, the task force. And additionally, I have worked for parental rights to make sure that our children are safe and that the options are there for them. But my opponent, he has sought to defund the police. He has sought uh, from this, you know, the, the entire campaign trail has sought to centralize education. I intend to put power back in the people's hands and I thank you for the opportunity. All right. Gentlemen, thank you. Our first question is coming from Pamela Wood with the Baltimore Banner. Thank you. This question goes first to Delegate Cox. You have a history of promoting distrust in elections. You've claimed the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump. You worked as a lawyer on his behalf in Pennsylvania, and you co-hosted buses to Washington, D.C. on January 6, 2021 for his Stop the Steal rally. And here in Maryland, you just fought unsuccessfully a legal battle over how some of the ballots will be counted. Do you trust that Maryland's election system is accurate? And should Marylanders believe that you will honor and accept the election results? Absolutely, I believe in our constitutional system. And as a constitutional civil rights attorney, that is exactly what I've been working to do in the legislature. That is exactly what I have pledged to do as your next governor, to ensure that really democracy is at stake, right? We have a republic that means the constitutional procedures must be followed. That's all I've ever sought to do and that's exactly what I intend to continue to do. And so just to follow up, um, I asked if you would accept the results of the election and believe that there's integrity. The way that the election is being carried out this fall, do you believe that will be accurate and will you accept the results? 
Well, I have always accepted election results that are fair and that are following the Constitution. I intend to look to the Constitution and uphold the law and the Constitution. At this point, we, it, it would be similar to saying that uh, before a surgery takes place to find out whether or not, uh, to decide whether or not the surgery went well. That is why the statute of Maryland actually protects Democrats, Republicans alike, to say there's a process that has to be followed, and every single candidate on the ballot has a right to that process, and I intend to uphold that process. Uh, and to Mr. Moore, now, uh, you have stated that you will honor the results of the election. Given the statements and actions of your opponent, it's possible that a, a meaningful number of Marylanders will not believe the results of the election. What more do you believe could be done to ensure election integrity and faith in the results of the election? Yeah, I, I want to read something. Uh, I am co-hosting two buses to the Million MAGA March slash rally with the Frederick County Conservative Club in support of at real Donald Trump on January 6th, 2021 to hashtag stop the steal. Demand no hashtag China Biden. Those are the words of my opponent. And so to Marylanders, I say this, we have free, fair, and transparent elections in our state. Never has the question of election integrity come up in the state of Maryland, and they will not come up in 2022. We are proud of the election process that we have here in the state of Maryland. And I will honor the results of the election, and I'm hoping that my opponent would do the same. Uh, thank you. But to my question, what more could be done to ensure public uh, trust in the election results? Do you well, have any proposals? Well, I, I think public trust in the election system is there. You know, we have an election system where we offer mail-in ballots. We have an, an, an election system where we offer early voting. We have an election system where we, offer, where we offer day of. And we have a court system that reinforced the fact that early ballots should be counted prior. We have a remarkably transparent election system in our state, and one that is irresponsible and, frankly, dangerous to continue to cast doubt in the election system of Maryland. Thank you. Our next question tonight. Tracy. May I, may I respond? Ten seconds, if you could. So the only thing that's dangerous is a candidate such as my opponent who wishes to centralize authority and uh, completely ignore the Constitution and the state law. That is what I have been seeking to do is uphold the state law for everyone. And that's exemplified even in my own county where a Democrat candidate uh, won, re won election by one vote and then the, the, the uh, certification process was then denied. Uh, just just this, set, this last month, uh, uh, in July, excuse me, because of the fact that there was a, qu a question as to the counting, that's the right of every single candidate on the ballot. That's the statute, that's the law. And I've worked across the aisle to ensure that uh, all of our elections have integrity. I have stood with ACLU attorneys to make sure one person, one vote, and I intend to uphold the law as we go forward. If, if, I, if I can just say, say something. We're going to keep moving. Quickly. I'll give you plenty of time towards the end, sir. I'm sorry. Tracy, go ahead. So, Mr. Moore, this question is for you. We wanted to discuss why you've only agreed to one in-person debate. Dan Cox appeared at Morgan State University's forum that you declined. The student paper from Morgan State said it's unfortunate that Westmore did not accept our numerous invitations to the forum. Dan Cox has accused you of running from him. Cox handedly won his party's nomination. How do you respond to Marylanders who feel that you are snubbing their nominee? Uh, I, I respond by saying that I'm excited to be here right now, today, debating Dan Cox. Uh, I, I respond by saying that we have spent time going all over the state of Maryland, going to all 24 jurisdictions, meeting voters where they are that we have spent time and will spend time on all four HBCUs in the state of Maryland because they're going to be incredibly important to the long-term vitality of our state. And truthfully, uh, you know, I'm excited to spend time with voters talking about the issues that they care about. Uh, and, uh, and while I'm, I'm eager to have this debate with, uh, with my opponent, uh, the fact that even Governor Hogan uh, said he will not support his candidacy and called him unfit to lead uh, I think it should be a clear indication to voters as to why I, uh, why I want to spend my time talking to voters instead of just on a debate stage constantly. And Mr. Cox, if you were to lose this election, would you be a bridge builder? Would you work to support the Moore administration? Well, absolutely. We need to be team players. And I would uh, begin by saying that uh, the fact that I have stood with Governor Hogan indicates that I am the only individual running for governor 
with experience, with the opportunity, who has served in government, and who has stood with Governor Hogan's policies to lower taxes, lower crime, while my opponent instead has sought to, in, on Salon.com, has proclaimed that he wants to defund the police. This is the difference between us. It's a stark difference. And when you look at the reason he won't debate, it's because he's a phony. There are so many things in his book that are completely false. If you look at the book, he claims he was raised in Baltimore City, but, sir, you weren't there until you were 34. Mr. Moore, I, give you a chance to respond. Thank you. I, I mean, we're, we're watching a perfect indication as to why Governor Hogan called you unfit to lead. We're watching a perfect indication as to why Governor Hogan has said, not only will I not support Delegate Cox, I won't even give him a tour of the governor's office. Frankly, I'm standing on stage right now with a, an extremist election denier whose rhetoric and whose policies are not just dangerous and divisive, but will take our state backwards. And the intention that I have in this campaign is I have an intention that we're going to talk about the issues that Marylanders care about, like ensuring we have a 21st century education system for all of our children, ensuring that we can keep our neighborhoods safe, ensuring that we can have a, an economy that grows and can benefit everybody, instead of delving into conspiracy theories that my opponent continues to throw out. I think that's preposterous. I, I need to respond. This is outrageous <laughs> and ridiculous. Uh, we are bigger right. than middle school name calling, sir. We have to get about the, the business of the state. And I have had lunch with the governor. I have toured the state house. So I'm not sure uh, where you've been, but I've been working in Annapolis for four years for the people of Maryland. I have been elected to do that. And I am running to restore opportunity, safe, safety, affordability, freedom, and education is my platform. That's what Maryland wants. That's what they're talking about at the dinner table. And that's what I am experiencing with my own family. And that's what we're going to bring to Annapolis. Gentlemen, that balance is needed. We're going to move on now to Alexis. Please. Thank you. Gentlemen, as you both know, Americans across the nation are feeling the effects of inflation. Residents of this great state feel the pain at the pump and in the grocery store aisle. Marylanders of every race, every creed and color are making tough financial decisions. But when it comes to black Marylanders, the effects of inflation are magnified. Black Americans make 71 cent for every white dollar. And as you pointed out this year, Mr. Moore, uh, white families in Maryland on average, have eight times the wealth of black families in this great state. What will you do if elected governor to close the racial wealth gap? Not just talk about it. What will you actually put in place to address this and do reparations play a part in your plan at all? Yeah. Um, I will give that to Mr. Or Mr. Cox first. So the only thing we need to talk about with reparations is making sure that the people who were robbed of their business and their wealth in the last two years with an authority that my opponent supports, and that is a lockdown authority. We need to make sure that we're back in the position to prosper once again. That's my platform and plan. When you look at my opponent, he's talking about uh, you know, transferring wealth away from people because of their skin color. That is racist. It's wrong. I will stand against that and say, I'm, about, I'm a civil rights attorney. I'm about equal justice for all of Maryland, making opportunities, bridge loans, opportunity zones. We need to make sure that our, uh, our, all of our citizens in Maryland have what they need to have an education. I mean, it's preposterous when you go to Baltimore City, and I've been there playing ball, and I've been to Morgan State when, Ms. when Mr. Moore refused to attend. And the cry of everyone's heart is, we've got to get our city and our state back on track, uh, both economically and safe. That's my platform. Mr. Moore wants to undermine that. The impacts of racial disparities did not start two years ago, Delegate Cox. We are watching something that has been a long-term challenge that our state has got to wrestle with and address. The fact that we have an eight to one racial wealth gap in our state is real. It's not pretend. And it's not because one group was working eight times harder. We have got to address this issue because it's not just impacting one group, it is impacting every single one of us. A recent report showed that the racial wealth gap, wealth gap has cost this country $16 trillion in GDP, not of a group, GDP. And so we've got to focus on creating pathways for work, wages, and wealth. Having an education system that's teaching our young people how not just to be employees, but employers. Making sure that we are increasing wages for Maryland families and getting to a $15 minimum wage and peg it to inflation. 
making sure that we're creating pathways for wealth. And that means addressing things like unaffordable homes. That means addressing things like unfair appraisal values in historically redlined neighborhoods. That means fixing broken procurement laws that we have in the state of Maryland that calls for a 29% goal in MBE participation, but we have not come close to hitting that number. We've got to take this, we've got to move into a direction where we're taking meaningful action and reparative action to be able to address the economic gaps that we continue to see in our society. All right, sir, thank you. We'll move to Jeff so, Salkin now. I'm sorry, if I need keep, to respond real keep, briefly. We're going to keep moving this time. We'll come back to another one. Uh, this is a question for both of you. It goes first to Mr. Moore. Student test scores nationally and in Maryland uh, are down. Are we doing the right things to help students catch up after the pandemic? Thank you. And, and the answer is we need to do more. You know, when, when I, I've been going all around the state and talking to parents and hearing the frustration, and frankly, it's not just a frustration in talking to parents. I have an 11-year-old daughter and an 8-year-old son myself. And we have a unique opportunity to get this right, where we have resources that are coming from the federal side, upwards of $1.9 billion that's earmarked towards educational supports. And we've got to ensure that that capital is going towards things like after-school supports, summer supports, advanced tutoring, that we have to make sure that we are properly implementing the blueprint for Maryland's future, which I was very proud to work on. Our administration will fully fund, and in partnership, we will properly implement. And I'm thankful for the support of Maryland's teachers who have backed my campaign that we are going to move holistically to be able to ensure that our children are getting a world-class education, an education that they deserve, and an education that our communities need them to get. Mr. Cox? So I want to begin by mentioning the clarity of, of what we just heard a minute ago. My opponent stated on record that he is for reparations. This is an extreme and inappropriate, divisive approach to healing the divides that we all know and love to, to see healed. That's what made Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman great. They sought to use our Constitution, like I have had the privilege of doing with civil rights laws, to advance freedom for everyone, not to create this division that my opponent is now on record saying that he's going to enforce with this uh, redistribution of wealth through reparations. That's appalling, and it actually re reflects the education question that you just asked, because that's part of his education program. That's not going to give us a world-class education. We need to get back to reading, writing, and arithmetic. We need to make sure that STEM technologies are uh, what our, our kids have access to. We need to make sure that we have school choice. That's part of my platform. I pledge to, to make sure that our schools actually turn on the HVAC and it works. We are going to restore world-class education in Maryland, and I'm proud to be part of that plan. It's a good segue to where we're going, I, gentlemen. Can, can, we, I'm, I'm sorry. Can I, can I just make a quick note? That, Ten seconds, we got to go. Thank you. Um, that my opponent, when asked a question about education, used it to say something that I did not say. I mean, this is, this is part of this dangerous rhetoric and this divisive rhetoric that will frankly move our state backwards. And, and, and I, I, I honor what, uh, what Governor Hogan said, because what Governor Hogan said about being, you being unfit to be in this office, you are putting on full display right now. Mr. Moore, instead of the back and forth, let's listen to some college students. I, I One second, to, please. We asked, two, we asked two journalism yeah, students. One moment, please. Uh, both from uh, Salisbury and Morgan State as well. And they want to know from the next governor uh, some questions from their standpoint. This is from Salisbury University. Hi, I'm Bees Beasley, the editor-in-chief of Salisbury University's student newspaper, The Flyer. My question for the candidates is, how will gun control and crime prevention intersect under your administration? Mr. Cox, if you want to go first on that. So it's important that we get the guns off the streets that are there illegally and being used uh, illegally for crimes. This is why I was on the governor's crime task force in my judiciary committee fighting with my fellow uh, legislators to take guns off the streets that are there illegally and being used in crimes. Mr. Moore and his team, they actually supported decriminalizing much of this and refused, the, the, the approach is, their approach was to refuse the, the felony approach that if you've used a gun in crime, that you should go to jail. Instead, they want them to run the streets. That's why we have 60% of the murders in Baltimore City right now being unsolved and unprosecuted. That's going to change on my watch. We are going to bring back law and order. We're going to bring back uh, the safety on our streets that everyone is crying out for. Yeah. Mr. Moore? Thank, thank you so much for that question. Uh, and it's incredibly important because there's no higher priority for any chief executive than public safety. People need to feel safe in their own communities, in their own homes, and in their own skin. 
And I, I, I think about what my opponent said that I said, which, by the way, I never said, once again. Uh, and also how my opponent likes to say that he backs the blue. The irony is the blue doesn't back you because the police officers have endorsed our campaign. And so the things that we are going to do in partnership in our communities is ensuring that we can get and keep these illegal guns off of our streets and get and keep these violent offenders off of our streets. And there's an important role that the state plays in that. There's also an important role that the state plays in making sure that we have a strong parole and probation system. When you consider a third of all violent offenders are in violation of parole and probation, that is a state function. And right now, it is understaffed and undermanned. We have to fix that. That we can actually put state resources to be able to make sure we're providing supports for violence intervention programs and violence interruption programs, which are continuing to show impacts because the people who are closest to the challenge are oftentimes the ones closest to the solutions. So we have to make sure that we have a state that's working in partnership with our local jurisdictions and also working in partnership with our federal counterparts to ensure we are getting and keeping illegal guns out of our streets and keeping violent offenders out of our neighborhoods. Mr. Costa, I'll give you a chance to respond if you'd Th like. Thank you very much. So, Ten seconds, please. Mr. Moore has long worked with Open Society, and they came into my committee, and, and I have a record of serving and protecting the, the blue and serving in my committee to defend them because Mr. Moore and his team came in and sought to defund the police in my committee. That was with the Open Society people. That was with the nonprofits that wanted to change and reimagine policing against the police and against you and I as citizens. I fought that. We stopped it. Instead, I'm going to fund the police. That's why sheriffs and officers on duty support me, not just unions, although I support them too. But we are going to make sure from day one that our streets are safe again. We will never say, like Mr. Moore said, in Salon.com, you can Google it and look it up, I need to wrap that up. he wants to defund the police. And not just that, he wants to indict the system. Now, that's not talk and rhetoric that's safe for any one of right, us. This is where we keep moving. Sorry, once to, again, that's, just, that's not true. Sir, we're going to go to Morgan State University. One moment. Hi, my name is Jana Mosley Lawson, a student political reporter here at Morgan State University. And my question is, now that the state of Maryland and HBCUs have made a settlement, what are some further steps that you think the state should take in order to further assist the HBCUs in the area? Mr. Moore. Great, thank you so much for that question. And our state is so blessed that we have four of the top HBCUs in America here in the state of Maryland. And now we have reached a, a settlement with the HBCUs that was, that was needed and long overdue. But there's a few different things that we've got to do. One is we need to make sure that the grounds why the settlement was reached in the first place are actually being honored. Because this was about duplication of coursework. This was about, not, about giving an unfair advantage to institutions who were not our HBCUs. The challenge is, despite the settlement being done, that practice is still happening. So we have to make sure that the grounds for the settlement are actually being honored. We also have to make sure that this is not just about the initial settlement. When you have four of the top HBCUs in America, that helps to address so many other challenges that we are seeing about how, we, how are we creating pipelines in our nursing industry? How are we creating pipelines in our education system? How are we creating pipelines of entrepreneurial growth and being able to focus on new industries, solar and wind technology, cyber and biotech technologies? We should be leveraging the genius of our HBCU students and making them a core part of Maryland's growth story. Mr. Cox. Well, unlike my opponent, I actually went to the HBCU debate at Morgan State University, and I spoke with the students there, and I was honored and privileged to be part of that. And one of the things that I said there, and I believe firmly, this is why I voted for the settlement. This is why I voted for our HBCUs to receive equal funding, and that is we need to expand programs for all of them to have things like tech opportunities, to have opportunities to get certifications in their degrees. But most importantly, I actually went through college myself on a Pell Grant. I know exactly how hard it is to make up the gap in your tuition. And yet, many times HBCUs have the funding levels differentiated, thinking that they're somehow receiving more funds than other universities in the state in the University of Maryland system. But that's just not the case. So we need to make sure we equalize not only the funding to the university, but the, to make sure that money gets to the student so that they don't have to drop out like, unfortunately, so many students in HBCUs end up doing. Pamela, back to you. Thank you. Uh, turning to health care. Uh, as you both know, access to abortion care is uh, protected by Maryland law, but not by national law. Uh, depending on the outcome of the election and the makeup of Congress, there could either be a proposal for a national ban on abortion or national protection for abortion. 
As governor, what would be your position on national abortion legislation? And would you get involved in that national debate on behalf of Marylanders? Uh, Delegate Cox, you go first. Uh, no, I'm focused on being the governor of Maryland, and I would make sure that everything that is uh, worked on in Maryland uh, reflects the interests and values of the people. I am pro-life. I am very honored and privileged with my wife to have a special needs son. That's why I fought on the House floor for the Down Syndrome Protection Act. And one of the things that this is near and dear to my heart is to ensure that everyone is safe, that women and children and the unborn all have equal protection and are, are, are supported by our, by our laws. And so when you look at um, you know, the, the national debate, it's turned back to the states. We have one of the most um, liberal abortion laws in the country. And I think that, um, you know, as governor, there's very little that I can do to override that or change it. So, this, you know, the, the idea that's come from my opponent that I'm somehow dangerous to women's health care is preponderous. It's false. It, it's, it's absolutely uh, not true. Mr. Moore, your position on national abortion legislation. Thank you. I, I believe abortion is health care, and I fully trust women to make this decision with their doctors. I want Maryland to be a safe haven for abortion rights, and I backed back last fall for a constitutional amendment, and if I become the governor, I will make sure that I will back it again. This is something that is not just a national issue. This is an issue for Maryland's women who want their health care to be protected. And when the Supreme Court made the decision to rob millions of women of health care, my opponent then the same day praised the Supreme Court and praised Donald Trump. So my, my opponent is very clear about where he stands on health care. He's very clear on the fact that he would criminalize abortion even in the case of incest and rape. He's very clear on where he is on, on, on abortion care. That he says that, that even in the case where the, woman, where the mother's life is, is in risk, that he would either force the mother to have the child or arrest her. He is very clear. And we have very different views. Abortion is health care. Scott, that, shaking that, your hand. Do you want to respond? Yes, thank you, uh, Jason. That is absolutely false. In fact, if you look at the abortion legislation, the, the pro-life bills I put in to the legislature, where I've actually had to work on this across the aisle with my colleagues, uh, I have had the three exceptions in, in the law. I believe that that is a legal process that should be followed. And this whole, uh, you know, stating of criminalization of absolutely false that's that's a preposterous situation uh, preposterous accusation it's it's demeaning it's wrong it's demeaning to women it's demeaning to the five women in my household and i tell you uh, this just de demonstrates that you cannot trust what comes out of my opponent's mouth i will say this i will defend unborn life but not take into this is why i'm running for governor not take into my power something that is not constitutional. When you hear my opponent saying that he's going to force into the Constitution a, a protection all the way through not only the third trimester, but the third, um, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, um, transaction, the, 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 all the way through the third trimester, that's his approach. And it's wrong. It's absolutely uh, disgusting to think that that's the position of my opponent. It's extreme, and I will instead uh, follow the law. With a direct attack, I'll let you respond if you'd like, or we can move on. Thank you. Now, the, the state of Maryland should never stand between the difficult decision that a woman has to make with her doctor about this issue. That when we are talking about abortion being health care, I trust women to make this decision with their doctors, not politicians and judges. This is a deeply personal and important thing for Maryland women and, frankly, all Marylanders to be able to embrace. And once again, while, uh, you know, while I, I think my, my opponent, both his, uh, his actions and deeds, uh, both historic and present, they speak for themselves. I want to be very, very clear. In a more Miller administration, we will protect reproductive rights. In a more Miller administration, we will make sure that Maryland is a safe haven for abortion care. Our general will move and on. I, we're, I need to respond. We're going to keep moving, sir. We're going to keep moving. We'll get to this next question here with Tracy. Yes. So sticking with the topic of health care and women's reproductive rights, I'd like to start with Mr. Cox. Mr. Cox, you are opposed to government mandates for vaccines against COVID, a potentially deadly virus. You cite that as why you ran for delegate, but you support the government telling women when they can and cannot practice the right to have an abortion. You have supported 14 bills 
restricting or rolling back abortion access as a delegate. Why do women's bodies deserve government oversight when you don't want oversight for your own body? Well, that's just a, a very loaded question that's certainly uh, demonstrating bias because that's not my position at all. I think it's uh, really obnoxious that um, the government wished to take possession of our bodies against the, uh, the law. The, the health care system allows for the decisions to be made between the individual and her doctor or his doctor. And that was what was trampled on the last two years. And so I stood firmly in saying, I'm for vaccines, uh, personal choices for that, but I'm opposed to vaccine passports. And that's what my opponent embraces. He, you couldn't even go to some of his events without demonstrating that you had an experimental vaccine. That's not the kind of direction of our state. It's not America. People had, should have their choices in these decisions. And as to the bills, every, like I said, the bills that I have supported have had exceptions. They have always focused on things like making sure women are safe with uh, the distribution of, of medication, making sure women are safe in their, um, in their procedures and in their ambulatory clinics, making sure that, that um, you know, little children like Down syndrome are not targeted just because of their being disabled. That's the future of abortion. My opponent is extreme on this issue. He, right now, will support and sign a constitutional amendment. And I, I believe, sir, that you would sign the bill that would also deny care after birth to someone who survived an abortion. That's extreme. My approach is, is more mainstream. Well, Mr. Cox, if you could just please answer the question about government oversight when it comes to one's body. And why, when it comes to vaccines, your feeling is that there should not be government oversight there, but for access to health care, there should be. The government's not forcing anybody about abortion. The government is forcing individuals to take a vaccine or lose their jobs. This isn't right. Even those who have, uh, many, many people have taken the vaccine, I applaud them. But even they agree in a majority that those who cannot, whether for disability or religious purposes, should not lose their job over this. That's why I've been fighting that issue. Mr. Moore, is there any part of Maryland's abortion access laws that you would like to see expanded or limited? Well, um, so can, can I, I first respond to the vaccine uh, question. Dur during the height of the pandemic, uh, we had a member of the Maryland General Assembly look to impeach Governor Hogan for his handling of it. We had a member of the Maryland General Assembly who sought to impeach Governor Hogan because he chose to follow the science because he chose to listen to the CDC and the NIH, because he chose to listen to Johns Hopkins University and the University of Maryland Medical Center. That member of the Maryland General Assembly was Dan Cox. And by the way, he stood alone. Even his Republican colleagues did not back that. So when we're talking about what it means and what's gonna happen in a more Miller administration, we are going to follow the science. We are going to listen to doctors and medical experts and not ideologues. We are going to ensure that we are going to keep the safety of the people of Maryland first and foremost in all of the decisions that we are going to make. And we are going to work across the state, across the aisle, and working with professionals in order to help us make those decisions. I would like would to, you like to answer the question about what uh, yeah, within Mar uh, Maryland's uh, abortion laws would you expand and or limit, Mr. Moore? Oh yes, please. Uh, and so, you know, when we talk about uh, abortion being health care, it's it's really important to remember what it is and who it is that we're talking about, because when we're talking about late term abortions, uh, you know, 99 percent of abortions are not late term abortions. When we're talking about truly late-term abortions, it's usually because there's a medical emergency. It's usually because that family is about to make one of the most difficult decisions of their life. It's because that family has now received news, chances are unexpected news, that no parent would ever want to have to make and no person would ever want to have to make. And so I trust women to be in partnership and relationship with their doctors. And I do not believe that lawyers and politicians and judges should be getting in the way of that relationship between a woman and her doctor. But unfortunately, that's not what my opponent believes because he stood here just now saying that he would decide whether or not you, be, you are forced to take an experimental EAU authorized vaccine. 
That's not the approach of freedom. And I think the approach that we need to get back to is to say, let's, the pe let's let the people decide. That's my approach. I want to get back to safety, making sure we have affordable housing, making sure we have freedom to make our own decisions, and, and make sure our education is world class again. Unfortunately, my opponent stands right here and says that he can make your decisions better than you on some of these issues, and that's wrong. Right. I, I, fi I find that the, the usage of the word freedom uh, to be amazing right now because my opponent talks about freedom but not the freedom of a woman or girl who potentially would have to, have, the, have to carry their rapist child. We talk about freedoms, but he's talking about the ability to criminalize abortions for both patients and the providers. So if we're going to talk about freedom, let's make sure we're consistent in understanding what you mean by freedom, sir. That's not true. Alexis, you're up. Uh, this will go to Mr. Moore first. Legal marijuana is a big business. Here in Maryland, residents have a plethora of dispensaries to choose from, but an overwhelming majority of those dispensaries are owned by Marylanders who do not identify as persons of color. Uh, we know that black Marylanders have bore the brunt of legal repercussions for illegal marijuana use. Now that the tide is changing, do you think it's fair to leave black entrepreneurs that are qualified out of this business that made $600 million last year in this state alone. Do you think there's an equity problem and what will you do to address it when it comes to legal marijuana? Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and it is a problem and it will be fixed and rectified in a more Miller administration. You know, we have to understand that if, uh, if the state votes uh, to, on, on question four uh, and that in our administration we will make sure that this rollout is going to be fair and it is going to be equitable. And that means using this as an opportunity to think clearly about how are we going about the, port, the, the prospects of, of positioning licenses, how are we thinking about not just everything from the growers and the manufacturers and the, and the paraphernalia providers, but truly using this as an opportunity to help address the wealth gap that exists within our society. But we also have to understand that it's not just going to be about that, that we cannot talk about the benefits of legalization if we're also not dealing with the consequences of criminalization. And where we've seen inside of communities, communities, and particularly black and brown communities that has been disproportionately harmed, that we have to focus on things like automatic record expungement for those who have cannabis convictions. We have to focus on things like being able to deal with the pardoning of people who have criminal records for something that is now a burgeoning industry in the state of Maryland. This is a unique opportunity for the state of Maryland to get this right. And in our administration, both on the economic equity, but also on the social justice perspective, this is going to be a core priority. Mr. Cox. Our laws shouldn't be based upon social justice reimagining of my opponent. We need to get back to fairness and equal justice under law. Everyone should be treated equal. That's why I do support a, uh, making sure that those who are criminalized for small possessions are no longer criminalized. We need to make sure that we have a path for people to reestablish themselves so they don't lose their job over something like that. That's something that I have worked across the island. In fact, in my committee, worked to decriminalize a, a few plants, particularly when you consider how so many people um, have appreciated the, the effects, even our veterans with PTSD. So, but that's not the same issue that we're dealing with. I need to have, we need to have a regulatory approach and I pledge to Maryland to work with our construction industry, with our law enforcement and with all sectors to ensure that there's appropriate testing, to make sure that there's safety on the job and to make sure that when we walk down the street that people know the rules. Jeff Sulkin. Governor Hogan has uh, gotten name-checked a lot in this debate so far. Question for both of you. Give us a, an exact final grade for eight years of Larry Hogan as governor. And if you would, name a policy of his that, that you would continue or something that you'd be anxious to change. Well, good one, Mr. Moore, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, I, I applaud the governor uh, for, for being so early and full-throated about the danger of this MAGA movement. I, I applaud the governor for calling it out early for what it is, that this is, a, that this is a danger to the basic values of democracy. And I'm thankful that the governor has come out and very early said that, uh, that he will not support uh, the Republican nominee, despite that being the nominee of his party. But the thing is I know about this, when it comes to where we are as a state, we've got to move faster. 
We've got to make sure that we can have true measurements of economic growth within our state. And that means being able to focus on helping to reduce the regulatory red tape for our small businesses, making sure that we can fix broken procurement laws to increase liquidity to our small and our micro businesses, making sure that we're putting a real focus on our MBEs and our WBEs, being able to provide economic and also educational supports, job retraining, job reskilling, focusing on apprenticeship programs and trade programs. Because right now in the state of Maryland, we have two available jobs for every single person filing for unemployment because we have a disconnect when it comes to skill sets and the skills that are required for Maryland's growing and diverse economy. Mr. We've Moore, got to focus on that. Final grade, A, B, C, D, or something else? Well, he's, he's not done yet, so it's incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cox. We'll handle it, Mr. Cox. <laughs> well, I'd give Governor Hogan an A on everything except the differences of opinion we've had on the handling of COVID. But I will say this, I have stood with Governor Hogan to make sure that our police are protected and backed. My opponent would like to defund the police and he actually had people in my committee on his team doing just that and I fought against it. And he will take us back to the years before Governor Hogan, who uh, stood against the taxes that we saw 42 tax increases back then. You are going to see tax increases like never before. The tolls are gonna to rise if Mr. Moore's governor. I will stand against that because I did it, I proved it. I've already done that in the legislature. I've stood with the governor on all of these issues. And I've also stood with the governor on school choice. And when you look at Mr. Moore's policies, he's about centralizing education. He's about indoctrination on his website from the, uh, from the, the state education uh, department. That's not the approach of Maryland. We need to put parents back in charge. That's what I pledge to do as your next governor. Um, I, 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 I want to be clear. There is nothing in my plan that calls for the raising of taxes. Nothing. Not a word. So I want to be clear with the people of Maryland about what is fact and what is fiction. Now, the thing that I do know is my opponent's economic plan that he has put out there would literally defund the police, defund education, and bankrupt the state. Literally. And I don't say that. That's not, a, that's not a, an ideological position. That's math. When you are looking at the things that we are focusing on in our economic plan, we're focusing on growth because we need for our economy to grow and we need to make sure we have higher levels of participation in our economy. And that means things like fixing a broken child care system. Because right now we've had over 750 child care centers close since the start of COVID. Oftentimes they are female entrepreneurs and are never treated as such. And we have to be able to get parents, particularly parents of young children, back into the workforce. It means focusing on job reskilling and job retraining. In my opinion, we swung the pendulum far too swift in one direction when we started evaluating high schools exclusively on four-year college acceptance rates, when that's not the path for every student. It wasn't my path. So we have to get our economy going and making sure we're getting more people able to participate in the new economy, in Maryland's new economy. My economic plan will not defund the police. I've fought for four years to support the police and making sure they have the funding they need. And I stood with the governor on this issue. My opponent actually is on record, Salon.com, saying he will defund the police because of 400 years of systemic oppression. And that's ludicrous. It's extreme. We need to focus on making sure that our economy works. And I take exception to the fact that my opponent's plan says that he's not going to raise taxes when it's all about spending. Well, we are at 44th in the nation for income tax. We have to lower that. We are at one of the worst situations for our senior ta taxes. We have to lower our senior tax. And when you look at the income tax and of our businesses, Delaware does it better. 5.5% income uh, uh, tax rate for businesses. Maryland's at 8.25%. It's no wonder jobs aren't uh, flourishing here, and it's no wonder we don't have the training and opportunities that we need to have. I will turn that around and say, let's keep Maryland open for business. Let's lower our taxes, not just pretend that you're not going to raise them, because every time you increase spending, like my opponent's plan in includes, you're going to have taxes come to roost very soon, and I will stand against that, just as Governor Hogan has done. All right, gentlemen, we're going to go to... We're going to get to Pamela now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, shifting topics, yesterday, as you may know, was National Coming Out Day. And in America, we've come a long way in embracing and accepting people who are LGBTQ+. My question is about public schools. Uh, we know that young people who identify as LGBTQ face a lot of challenges. Do you believe these children are being adequately supported in our public schools? And are public schools doing a good enough job educating the whole student body about LGBTQ issues? The question goes first to Delegate Cox. 
No, we're not doing enough because too many times we exclude the parents from involvement. In fact, I fought against a bill that would literally allow 12-year-olds to receive counseling without their parents even knowing. That's wrong. We need to make sure that parents are involved because the, the data shows that when parents are involved in their children's lives, all of the concerns, uh, whether it be emotional, sociological, or uh, physical concerns, are so much better handled. And that's what I pledge to do as your next governor. What I will do also is ensure that the indoctrination stops. We cannot have transgender indoctrination in kindergarten. I mean, that's preposterous. That's exactly what my opponent supports. It's on his website. I will stand against that and eradicate that from the curriculum and get back to world-class learning, making sure it's all about STEM technology, making sure we have reading, writing, and arithmetic so that our kids can learn like God's intended them to learn. Because why? Every person is made in the Imago Dei. Every person has an equal opportunity made in the image of God to have unalienable rights that we protect, and we can't do that when we exclude parents. Uh, Delegate Cox, as a follow-up, what exactly do you mean by indoctrination? What do you believe is going on in kindergartens that's harmful to children? Well, just look at the uh, the documents that are being published right now. There's uh, instruction on, uh, you know, think, there's books literally in the, in, in the schools at this moment in Maryland called Gender Queer, which depict things that I cannot show you on television. It's so disgusting. We're going to change that and say, let's get back to math. Let's get back to making sure that our kids know how to read and write. Right now in Baltimore City, for instance, 7% passage rate in some of the uh, schools. These schools need our help. We need to make sure that the $2 billion, for instance, that went into Baltimore City last year, that that is actually getting to the classroom, to the teachers, and to the students. Uh, Mr. Moore, what do you believe public schools should be doing to support and educate LGBTQ plus yeah. students? Well, I mean, many of the, the issues that we're discussing are being addressed at the, at the local level. Uh, and it's important for the state to understand that we're a partner in that. Uh, but we don't dictate to the local jurisdictions as to, as to how their educational processes work. There is something that I do think it's important for people to understand, though. Uh, you know, I have an 11-year-old daughter and an 8-year-old son. All I ever want for my children is for them to be seen and for them to feel like they're being heard. And I want the same thing for every child. And so there's a stat that always does stick with me as well. It's looking at the acceler accelerated youth homelessness rate for LGBTQ youth in our state. It's looking at the fact that trans children or trans individuals, 80% of trans individuals have contemplated suicide. I want to say to all of our LGBTQ youth and families, I see you and I hear you. And all policies that will be made will be made in partnership because that is how we have to lead as a state, in partnership. Gentlemen, thank you. Tracy? Well, if I may respond briefly. Um, so I have children also. As you know, um, I'm uh, very blessed, my wife and I. And we believe and we understand that when the, uh, any child is struggling, as my opponent identified, you cannot cut the parent out of that discussion. And that's exactly what my opponent plans to do, because that's the policy right now under this uh, new approach that I have opposed. And that's wrong. We have to get back to making sure parents are involved, to make sure that when I have the opportunity to sit down with my son or daughter, that they know dad is always in the mix for them. And Mr. Cox, you're that's mentioning the issue that in, in your, front of us. your prior answer. We're going to go ahead to Tracy. And, and um, uh, I'm sorry, can I, can I please just say one thing? Um, uh, I am very involved in my children's education. and. And I care deeply about their education. Do you know who also cares deeply about their education? They're educators. Because we have the same goal. It's to make sure that my children are prepared for the world that they are going to inherit. And we want the same thing for all of our children. And educator participation is not indoctrination. Okay, this is a partnership that we have between parents and educators. But we're not up against our time here, gentlemen. We're Tracy now. gentlemen, we're going to give Tracy the floor. So I would like to shift the conversation to climate change. There was a federal lawsuit filed yesterday by environmental groups to try and prohibit the widening of I-270 and part of the Capitol Beltway with toll lanes as proposed by Governor Larry Hogan. The suit claims the expansion promotes auto dependency and will exacerbate climate change. Where do you stand on transportation and its impacts on the environment in this state? We can start with Mr. Cox. Well, thank you. I'm a strong advocate. In fact, every year that I've run for office, 
I've been advocating to ensure that our transportation works so that we have uh, our families getting, actually, you know, getting home to be with their families and to have that opportunity to get home to dinner instead of sitting in what we call a parking lot in my district of 270. That's unconscionable. It actually hurts the environment to sit there and to have the car idling so much. So I support widening I-270. I support widening our bridges and, and securing our transportation. That's why I will uh, look to the Transportation Trust Fund to bring transparency to that and to make sure that we get these projects done. My opponent, though, wants to ban gasoline cars. His, his response is to force us all into some kind of public transportation system. That's the Moore Miller approach because his running mate was uh, one of the individuals that co sponsored the legislation. So I will not support that. I believe very strongly in, in ensuring all the above options are there, and I will support transportation as we need to improve that and, and make sure that works for every Marylander. Mr. Moore. I, I, I'll, I'll once again start with that is just not true. Um, but when we talk about transportation assets, uh, we are going to make sure that we are doing things like addressing the, the deep congestion that sits on 270 in the Beltway. It is psychologically, economically, and environmentally dangerous to have that level of congestion. So we are going to address that along with making sure that we are fixing the American Legion Bridge over this next decade. It is unsafe, along with making sure that we are going to get the red line done in Baltimore because you cannot talk about economic vitality if you do not have, have east-west transit. But there are three lenses that we're gonna look at every single economic project. One, it's through the lens of equity, making sure we're understanding who is building it and who can benefit from it. The second is the environment, making sure that the transportation assets that we're pulling together are actually not only not hurting the environment, but actually using transportation assets to help it. And then the third piece is making sure there is local involvement and local engagement. We are going to address the issue of congestion but we're going to make sure that we're doing it in an environmentally sound way. And that includes things like being able to add the electrification of the grid for electric vehicles. That means adding mass transit options. This is Maryland's time to lead on this. We have unique resources to do so, and that's what Maryland will do. I'm going to try to be quick with a, one last question because we'll get you into your closing statements. One last one from Alexis. All right, last question, gentlemen. If you are elected to the seat of governor for the state of Maryland, what will you do to address health disparities and specifically disparities in communities that are disproportionate, disproportionately placed next to highways, next to power plants and industrial areas that have more pollution? Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Leave no one behind. That is the mantra, that's the agenda that we are going to have for our not just campaign, but for our administration that every single community must be seen and heard in conversations. And the truth is, for many of you who have said to me over the past year and a half, we don't feel seen, we don't feel heard by our elected officials. Uh, the reality is, for many of you, you haven't been. That there's a reality of, for example, in Baltimore, that children in Baltimore have double the asthma rate of the rest of this state. There's a reality that in the Eastern Shore, because of climate change, that we have literally a quarter of the Eastern Shore that in the next 50 years is in danger of flooding for its businesses and homes. And so we're going to make sure that we're starting with a core focus on building out equitable frameworks in the way that we're talking about environmental supports, affordable housing, making sure that we're addressing the healthcare disparities, and that includes things like the negotiation of prescription drug costs, and making sure we're making it easier for seniors to be able to age in place and age in dignity, and also ensuring that we can have an accessibility to health care coverage for every single Marylander. Gentlemen, I want to get your closing statements in. I'll let you answer this question, then we'll keep moving. So I want to start by, first of all, pointing out that uh, my opponent is, just to uh, be able to rebut the statement about mm -hmm. gasoline cars, he is on board with, and he even said it, changing the electric grid to allow for electric cars. And it's not just the allowance of it. We have a 2035 plan that he supports to tie us similarly to California, which has a plan to ban gasoline cars. That's a problem. It's not going to work for our small businesses. And when my opponent says he wants to leave no one behind, well, unfortunately, as a, a CEO of Robin Hood, a nonprofit that's supposed to help the poor, he left Baltimore behind while he was making millions. And he's currently living in a $3 million home while he leaves Baltimore and the rest of the state Sir, behind. I'm now, to, I'm glad to cut you to, now. If you'd like a closing statement, I've got to stop you now. Well, I, I was going to just wrap it up because I see okay. I have 16 no. seconds left on the clock. It is taking uh, away the, from the your health. closing statement. Well, that was actually my, my time but uh, for the, the question. But okay. 
Um, so I would object to saying that that's my closing statement. No, I no, think no, that no, the sir. health disparities are clear. I'm a Medicaid supporter. I will provide community health clinics. We'll work to expand our health care across the we state. we got to move, sir. Mr. Moore, closing statement, please. Thank you so much. We've spent the last hour hearing how I my opponents' told that dangerous I, and divisive I, views I told that I had would first, restrict abortion sir, access. You'll get a closing statement. But I was told I was supposed to go first because he went first. That's all. That was the rules. Yeah. Mr. Is, Cox, if you'd like to go first, go right ahead. Please, okay. go, go, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Well, it is an honor and privilege to be your next governor if I earn your vote, and I'm here to earn your vote. I'm going to once again make Maryland safe. Why? Because we are dealing with some of the worst aspects of crime in not only the nation, but in the world. My opponent wants to defund the police. He wants to, quote, indict the system. I will stand against that for you. I will be the only balance possible because a one-party rule is not the way of the future of Maryland. We have to have an opportunity for safety, for affordability of housing. I will lower property tax assessment valuation so we can cut those rents and cut those uh, taxation. I will make sure that we have freedom, once again, where you choose your health care with your doctor. And education must be world class. We're going to end the indoctrination. We're going to end the politi politicization of our classrooms. We're going to make sure teachers are empowered and parents are back in charge. I am humbly asking for your vote. Thank you for the opportunity. You can go to coxforfreedom.com and, and sign up. Mr. Moore. Thank you. We, we have spent the last hour hearing about how my opponent's dangerous and divisive views would restrict abortion access and his economic plans would move Maryland backwards. So you can see we have very different views on, on policies, but we also have very different values. You know, my opponent likes to throw around the word freedom, but freedom is not an empty word to me. My life could have gone a very different way after my dad died. I could have been left behind. But I'm running for governor because we can do better. As a state, we can get these deadly illegal guns off of our street. We can build an economy that lifts everyone up. We can protect abortion access. I've spent my entire career bringing people together to make our country, our state, and our communities better. And that's what real patriotism looks like. And I'd be honored to have your support as we move Maryland forward in this next decade. All right, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Have a good, good night. The uh, choice is yours. Into the voting booth you go. Thank you.